you should be able to get your probiotics and prebiotics from your food. You shouldn't have to rely on XYZ probiotic pill in order to get good gut bacteria. And so is it helpful? Yes. Is there one perfect one? No. And so, you know, when people say, oh, which, which strain I see, you know, this pill has eight strains of bacteria, but this one has 12. So this one's got to be better. We don't know if you need all those 12 strains or what the mechanism or composition of the bacteria is in your gut. And so giving you the one with 12 strains in it versus eight strains may not be the best blueprint for you. And so really, you know, there isn't one silver bullet probiotic supplement pill that's out there. So that's why you won't really see someone making a, you know, recommendation saying this one more than that one um, that that is needed. And of course, there is studies showing certain bacteria that strains that are beneficial for you. But no one's going to come out outright and say, this is it. This is the silver bullet and you must take this. You can get them from foods. So how many servings of prebiotics and probiotics should we be getting in a day? Oh, there isn't a an amount of prebiotics and pro- probiotics. It's the amount of fiber that you should really be concentrating on. And so the ADA recommends uh, that women get 25 grams of fiber per day and men get up to 38. And so, you know, that can be in different forms, whether you're getting that as a soluble fiber or an insoluble fiber, but that's what's going to help get a good amount, a healthy amount of pre and probiotic types of foods. Because your body responds to that fiber by Correct. creating the bacteria. The bacteria right. eat the fiber. Correct. Right. And so is that ADA recommendation enough? I've heard on the internet that you should be getting a lot more fiber per day. And we're and I think average we get like, what, 12 grams? Is that right? Like uh, people are getting significantly less than the recommended. Correct. And, and some people are use, using the, uh, the fiber gummies, right? And those have about three grams of fiber in one. I mean, you'd have to eat the whole damn jar mm. in order to get a sufficient amount, right? So I think that it's more important to figure out if you can get up to that 30. I feel that chia seeds are actually a quick and easy way to get fiber because one, two tablespoons actually of chia seeds have uh, approximately 10 grams of fiber in them. So really, if you're trying to get to that 38 number or that 25 number, it doesn't take that much of chia seeds, which can really be mixed into you know anything and everything mm-hmm. to get at least some degree of fiber. So what are some other food hacks for fiber? What would you say are some other like really good foods that have a high amount of fiber that we can be adding to our diet to get to that amount? So yeah, so first things first, I would say chia is the number one because it's a small, tiny seed. It's pretty tasteless. You can put it in water. You can put it on food. You can put it in your salad. And if you have kids who are constipated, you can literally make them a chia seed pudding with any form of other liquid, whether it's in their milk, whether it's in a pudding, and you could kind of mix it in and make it into a jelly-like substance, and it's pretty filling. And, you know, it's great for kind of also satiety, right? If you're trying to avoid eating a lot, have fiber first, right? Mm -hmm. That'll prevent your sugar spike. It'll help fill your belly. It'll help it expand. And so that's going to help. So that's your number one for fiber. Number two, I think any cruciferous vegetable that you can get, if it's green, and leafy and hard to cook and or smells like a fart, that (laughs) is probably what you want to eat, right? If it makes you feel bloated because it produces a lot of gas, likelihood is that it's really good for you. Those are not the ones you want to avoid. People are like, oh, I'm I'm, I'm going to not eat fibrous vegetables because they make me bloat. Yeah, because they produce certain gases, but are you going to not give your gut what it needs. No, this is a temporary thing where that gas needs to pass. That's great. In terms of gut health, again, are there effects of certain, you know, people are doing all sorts of diets. They're doing carnivore diets, keto diets. What is the effect of your gut microbiome with these sort of diets? So, you know, there is that that old saying, right? Everything in moderation. And we're learning more and more that red meat has deleterious effects on the microbiome increases the risk for colon cancers. So of course you want to, if you're gonna eat meat, then you wanna have leaner white meat. If you're going to eat something in terms of filling you up, eat fiber that's going to kind of help that bacteria make those short chain fatty acids. So try to be more plant-based, try to have more fiber. And I'm not gonna tell you to avoid 
all alcohol or avoid all sugar and, you know, everything in moderation, right? Am I going to tell you zero sugar for the rest of your life? No, that's, that's impossible. Being that restrictive is going to be very hard. Am I going to tell you to avoid as much sugar as you can? Yes. Because sugar, again, overall changes the gut microbiome. You become more insulin resistant. It's going to increase your weight. And so eventually it'll have you, um, you know, craving more carbohydrates, more sugar, which is then going to impact it. And that leads to obesity. Having a you know piece of chocolate here and there, that's fine, right? In moderation, have a glass of wine here or there. But is it daily? No. And maybe have your fiber first. Absolutely. The order in which you have things definitely matters, right? If you're going to eat and you've been fasting, intermittent fasting, and the first thing you do in the morning is you're going to eat, the first thing you should probably do is eat something with a protein and a fiber. That is going to prevent your blood sugar from spiking. And instead of having your donut first or, you know, your sugary orange juice first, right? Because that's going to cause the blood sugar to spike significantly. So instead of doing that, have your fiber first so that the spike is much lower when you do add that orange juice in second. So gut health and your skin. So this is something that I, I realized, like actually learned from you on your TV segment that gut health has a huge impact on the quality of your skin and the yeah. collagen. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, our gut flora has so much to do with the overall skin uh, health of our skin. And so you want to really stimulate collagen production and your body really depends on vitamin C for that. Right. So a lot of these fermented foods have a lot of one, a lot of good beneficial bacteria and two, a high content of vitamin C in them. So again, sauerkraut, kombucha and kiwis, ton of vitamin C that helps with collagen and elastin production. And that can actually stimulate for the collagen and elastin to grow in your skin and gives you that smooth texture. That's awesome, man. What you eat, forget Botox, man. Start eating real food. Yes. Start eating fermented food. Start eating kiwi. Yes. And see the benefit on your skin. 100%. That's awesome. So there's some data on fecal transplants for people who have bad gut microbiome, mm-hmm. right? Like with this is something that occurs due to diet, but also is passed down generationally, I understand. And so at some point, like, you know, it may be difficult to repopulate good bacteria. Is that, is, am I, am I, do I understand that correctly? Yeah. So especially in people who've got something called recurrent clostridium difficile infections, and you have tried antibiotic courses to help, you know, treat and get rid of this uh, bacteria and overgrowth of this bacteria. If over time and multiple rounds of treatment for C. diff is not working, then and it is indicated to get something called a fecal microbiota transplant. There are actually now new pill forms of the FMT that have come out that are FDA approved to actually get that good bacteria back to kind of repopulate your gut such that it actually prevents the recurrence of another C. diff infection. So do you see a future where we'll be able to assess the bacterial load of someone's gut microbiome and then be able to either take a pill or do like a, a fecal transplant to repopulate like a healthy gut? Is that something that you think you know, could happen in the future? Some version of it. I mean, there are so many of these tests out there that are like, you know, that are testing your microbiome, that are testing, you know, how much sensitive, what sensitivities you are and all that kind of stuff. I think it's in the works. You know, we certainly haven't perfected anything of that nature yet. And, you know, it's going to take a lot of time because each of us has a variable microbiome that is ever changing, right? Every time you eat something or Let's say you eat something bad or you have an infection, whether you have a cold or you ate a bad taco, right? Your your microbiome changes. So it's an ever-changing thing. So how often are you going to sequence it? How, how expensive is it going to be? How accurate is it going to be, mm-hmm. right? Those are all things that we don't quite know yet. Yeah. But in an ideal world where money isn't an issue and access is not an issue and you know, you know, getting to a scientific, you know, validity. Yeah, that'd be great where we can, you know, have it sequenced all the time live. You're like, all right, I'm missing a little bit of bifidobacterium today. And I'm going to eat just uh, two more ounces of kefir. And, you know, that is it. I'm back down to perfection. Yeah, I would love that. (laughs) And so, yeah, some of these, so you make a good point that like some of these things are taking one snapshot in a moment, right? These at home tests. And so they're not necessarily giving you data of like a long time span. So it may not be relevant. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. And a lot of it is also, you know, because it's ever changing, we don't know, one, it's very long. And two, 
it, it's again, it, it's a snapshot. And so it, it's too versatile for us to really hone it down and say, okay, this is the exact formulation that you need today. And that's that. In terms of other things that can affect gut, gut health, how about fasting or artificial sweeteners or cleanses? Like how are these things playing a role? Ooh, okay. So let's let's tackle each of those. Intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting, as you do it for a longer and longer time, it helps by reducing your insulin levels and um, also lack of stimulation by food, specifically sugars, helps to allow for certain types of bacteria to grow and allows for the bad bacteria to be able to not proliferate as much, which is certainly helpful. It helps in terms of insulin sensitivity, okay? So that will alter the microbiome and have you craving things that are healthier rather than always craving, craving maybe more sugary, more carbohydrate-rich foods, okay? Is there like a length of fast that's like that's been looked at specifically? I mean, is it good to do a shorter fast or a longer fast or like people are doing week-long fasts? There, that is a varied and an entire topic in itself. I think there have been studies that at least 16 hours to 18 hours is a good window as to when you start seeing an effect in terms of insulin sensitivity. But there are so many varying studies out there. You know, some say, you know, you just need at least 12 hours to see some benefits. Some people say, you know, 16 hours a day makes a big difference. But for some people, hormonally, you know, genetically, and also with their underlying stress levels, that may not be possible for them. Because if you're putting your body under constant stress by fasting, you may be raising your underlying cortisol levels. And if on top of that, you have a stressful life or you have psychological distress, it may not be as effective for you, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, while you're doing it all correctly, you may be starving for five days on end and then not seeing some of the results because other hormones have come into play. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's really important to remember. Yeah, yeah, that's really helpful. And then what about cleanses? Oh, cleanses. So there isn't really a cleanse out there that is, you know, perfect or recommended because one, it's just temporarily wiping out the flora of your gut. 